Hello and welcome to the sessions on quick prep. In this particular video series, we are going to talk about something called as corporate finance. Now, corporate finance at level one is pretty small a topic as far as um, you know the, the exam weightage is concerned. But what is critical about this topic is the fundamentals that you're going to learn here are going to be useful in a lot of other modules. So, so your uh, capital budgeting, cost of capital, your dividends, some of the very very critical you know pieces here. So, so what we thought is uh, you know at Fin Study Club to give you a quick overview of all the formulas which are there, uh, the the critical and and the you know the important formulas, so that you can just you know have a quick overview of the entire course and in, in absolute no time so here I am starting with capital budgeting capital budgeting one of the numericals uh, you know, numerically oriented readings in uh, corporate finance uh, you know is, is one of the you know a category element which is very very critical so there are out of six uh, you know uh, there are there are about uh, you know two very very critical uh, you know a category reading which is capital budgeting and cost of capital so allow me to take capital budgeting first so in capital budgeting, we're trying to evaluate a particular capital expenditure. Should we do or not? So the question that we are grappling up with, a yes or a no. And to do that, we got to compare the benefit with the cost. Now, this comparison happens with five different techniques. So the techniques that you see here are, are those five, uh, essentially the benefit versus cost comparison. Each of these techniques is a mathematical construct, individual and independent of, of others, and will have a different unit. For that matter, net present value will have a dollar amount as the unit. So the final value, you know, a benefit or a cost, so net benefit, so to speak, is going to be in dollar terms. Internal rate of return is actually a percentage, and so is your the the average accounting rate. Uh, profitability index is an indexed feature, so you would have one point something coming as an answer. Okay, and there is another called as payback period, which is more of a conceptual thing that in how much time does your investment come back. So that's, that's, that's an easy thing. So, so talking about the NPV first. So here, you're going to talk about all the uh, investing timelines. So you're going to plot all your future inflows and your outflow today. So your outflow today is, uh, is, is, is with a negative sign and all the inflows with a positive sign and you discount them using your WACC. WACC is your weighted average cost of capital applicable to this time period. So it doesn't matter where you are right now, how old you are, doesn't matter. What is the funding that you're raising for this particular capital expenditure? The, the proportionate cost for that particular funding is called as your VAC for this particular discounting thing. So this outlay is what we're referring to, is your present value of cash outflow, which is typically at T0, okay? So we are taking a conventional cash flow pattern where the outflow happens only at T0. In a non-conventional pattern, although we don't expect it to come at level one, there might be an outflow, you know, happening in, in a particular future years, in which case the calculation remains absolutely simple there as well. Whatever are the outflows, just discount them and add it to this particular element. Okay, fantastic. So just keep in mind that the rate here that you're using to discount is your VAC. Okay, it is not the return that you're earning, but the return that you're giving to someone else, the capital providers. Coming to the second point, and this is where a little bit of confusion crops up. The internal rate of return, simply put, it is a return that you earn. It is not the return that you pay. So this needs to be dif distinguished with WACC. And in fact, this becomes the decision point as well. So if I have borrowed as a business, if I have borrowed money from my capital providers at 8%, this is the minimum return I would like to earn on my assets. So this. 8% will be compared to the returns that I'm going to earn on my assets uh, on which I would be able to take a final decision point of 4%. If this is a positive number, I'm going to go ahead, otherwise not. Okay, so internal rate of return, it's a mathematical number. It's, it's a mathematical construct wherein it is that hypothetical rate at which my present value of cash inflow is equal to the present value of cash outflow keep in mind that these inflows and outflows that we are referring to is of the investing timeline. By investing timeline, I mean the project, okay? So so these are the cash inflows and outflows and you hypothetically try and equate them. So that's your IRR. The third is a very, very bad technique called as average accounting rate, which is not based on cash, nor does it have any time value of money. So it says if my project is going to run for three years, what is going to be my average book value of the asset? So now, now do you see that there is a lot of accounting adjustments which is being referred to here is book value or let's say so it will be subject to something called as depreciation as well, so on and so forth. And the numerator of that 
is the total profits made in the three years by the way PAT not CFAT so it is a total profit divided by the number of years so it's like the per year profit divided by on an average investments every year so it's a very very bad ratio it doesn't take into account the cash nor does it take into account the time value of money comes the fourth concept of profitability index which is a very similar to net present value the difference is that NPV is subtractive and this is divisive so what we do is uh, in NPV we try and calculate uh, PVCI minus PVCO however in case of profitability index we try and take this PVCO to the denominator so what we get typically is PVCI divided by PVCO so let's say so, uh, so I have hundred and ten dollars and this is hundred dollars so I'm gonna get 1.1 it simply means unspoken denominator is one so it simply means that by putting a one dollar of investment I'm being able to generate 1.1 so this point one is the Delta which is the corresponding figure for NPV so I can also therefore uh, refer to PV uh, profitability index as let me break this into two parts PVCO plus NPV upon PVCO so this becomes one so I get a final number of one plus NPV upon PVCO so it's just the same formula which is being you know referred to in a different context comes the second reading very very critical uh, cost of capital one of the longer readings one of the important readings and therefore an A plus category reading so it talks about different you know individual costs how do you calculate the different individual costs uh, you know the way the the reading materials have been published is they start with VAC my suggestion always is to start with individual cost of capitals uh, because until unless you know how do you calculate individual cost of capital you'll not be able to put these numbers here so let us go in the order in which you know let's say the study material publishes uh, so assuming that you know how to calculate these return of debt the return of preferred and return of equity you just put them into different weights and obviously the the, the fundamental is absolutely clear that the sum total of all the weights have to be one or hundred percent in any mathematical form that you would like to keep the uh, taxation angle into mind uh, you know that it's only the cost of debt that needs to be made after tax cost of preference and equity is already bases the dividends and the returns which are anyways at an after tax level now there's there is a confusion that crops up you know when we talk about the <coughs> debt to equity and the total ratio so sometimes it says that the debt to equity is let's say three now how do you decode that into and convert it into weight you know an obvious common sense thing is to make it you know three times to 0.75 and 0.25 but how do you get this so uh, you know quickly now now the way I, I, I tell, tell, tell my candidates is debt upon equity so divide it into three parts debt equity and total so if debt is three equity is one so total must be four so the weight is not the relish, re relation of debt to equity the weight is actually the relationship of debt with the total and equity with the total so therefore uh, you have 3 divided by 4 giving you 0.75 and 1 divided by 4 giving you 0.25 please never you know kind of uh, you know, the weights should not be intra the capital structure it should always be of a particular uh, you know the source of capital with the total okay keep that in mind coming to the individual cost of uh, you know different sources the cost of debt or cost of preferred see the fundamental is exactly same so there is a borrowing timeline that you have plotted and the rate of that borrowing timeline is your cost of capital now here I would like to again take and raise up the issue of IRR IRR is also the rate but it is the rate of the investing timeline as I told you however cost of capital is the rate of the borrowing timeline so if let's say I have borrowed hundred dollars there is a plus sign for me at T0 and I am giving someone hundred and fifteen after two years so what is the rate so this is you know an outflow for me so what is the rate which equates PVCI to PVCO now this has nothing to do with your IRR now this is the relationship that the business has with the debt providers there would be an independent relationship that the business would have with its preferred providers or equity provider for that matter so all these relationships are independent relationships so when we're talking about the cost of preferred so let's say we borrowed hundred dollars at T0 from the preferred providers and uh, 
uh, to them a year later I have paid let's say 123 so their rate of this timeline will be a little different and you know will be different than the cost of that share I'm going to get so every individual source of capital will have their respective what we call as a borrowing timeline the borrowing timeline keep that in mind okay and for IRR what you need is an investing timeline investing timeline is nothing but the timeline of the money that you are investing into so it has an outflow at the beginning and followed by a lot of inflows the borrowing timeline is exactly the opposite so it has inflow right now followed by a lot of outflows okay so the value of everything the value of preferred stock etc etc the cost of preferred stock this is a simple formula so the present value is equal to the future cash flows divided by the rate now let me put few values future cash flows are the preference dividend okay this is cost of preferred and this is the intrinsic value of preferred now out of three any two might be missing and you might have to calculate the third angle so so we are not kind of mugging up the formula as such we're trying to just create a good construct so that should there be a question from any front you would be able to now coming to cost of equity which is obviously the most meaty and most critical you can calculate the cost of equity in three different ways the first is the capital asset pricing model this is something that you would also talk about in your portfolio management in which you are trying to justify a required return on the basis of the risk which is involved so this is the average risk premium of investing into equity multiply that by the sensitivity the unique sensitivity of that stock which is represented by beta which is a systematic risk because the people who uh, you know the, the founders of these model believed that it's only the systematic risk which should be taken into account because at a portfolio level the unsystematic risk has already been uh, diversified so there is no compensation that should be given to the investor for that and obviously this is becomes the unique risk premium to be added to the uh, base rate the risk free rate which the rate at which you know the, the rate which everyone should get even without taking a risk uh, coming to the second point was dividend discount model which is again based on time value of money now, this was created by Myron Gordon one of the very very renowned financial economist who said that I'm going to assume that the dividend growth is going to be constant now obviously it, it is one of the very big criticism that the constant growth of dividend uh, and obviously what is going to be the rate of uh, you know that growth can it be more than GDP and less than GDP can it be so so all that thing set aside but it was nevertheless a very good uh, you know way to break the uh, the deadlock which was happening because we are unable to calculate the set pattern of the equity dividend because unlike preference they're not fixed and 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 the timing also is not so until and unless the, there is some kind of a sanctity in the time series that you're plotting the mathematical arithmetic and geometric progression would not be able to give you a present value so Gordon said let me assume the constant growth and here I am with this formula so the present value of a perpetuity which grows at a constant rate is the first annuity the first term divided by uh, let's say 1 minus the constant ratio and if you utilize this mathematically you get this formula d1 upon k minus g obviously the limitation as you can yourself see is the growth uh, has to be less than uh, the cost of equity otherwise the denominator is going to become a uh, you know the uh, negative figure and you can't have a share value with negative so, so the lowest value that it can get is zero it being a limited liability concept okay just just a bit on that so it is again rearranging the formula so so d1 upon ke minus g is equal to p0 so if I have to just rearrange that I'm going to get the formula that you write here so it's not a rocket science sustainable growth rate the growth rate that the dividend will experience is actually a matter of how much is the portion that you are retaining multiply that by the earnings that you're going to get on that retained portion so it, it, it is actually a you know a combination of both of them so uh, and this can also be uh, you know return on e the retention rate can be made as one minus dividend payout ratio so, so these are some of the formulas that you have to kind of you know work around the third method to calculate the cost of equity is through bond yield plus risk premium approach in which case we are saying that the cost of equity of a particular company C1 will be equal to the cost of bonds for that particular company plus the average risk premium of investing into equity versus bonds 
Now this average risk premium is going to be consistent and same for all the companies in that particular economy stroke market because here there is no company specific issue. If at all there is a company specific issue is being built into the bond yield. So this is exactly what is equal to your cost of debt plus the average yield. Answer by all the three approaches bond yield dividend discount and cap -um might be different uh, and you have to also see the fitment as to information given according to you know which model uh, you know will actually justify as to which model will be, you be able to use in the exam so if let's say beta is given that means the exam is hinting you to use cap -um. if constant growth is given then the exam is hinting you to use dividend discount model if cost of debt is given so likewise you know there's a third model that you have to kind of use now Coming at the break point, and this is not equal to break even point, something which you have to keep in mind. The break point is that portion of capital at which, so if I have to plot the total capital here and I have to plot the WACC here, now here, the if I plot the VAC curve, uh, you know, the, it's going to be upward sloping. The reason being that more the amount of capital that I borrow, keeping the capital structure same, the debt the portion of the debt will also go up. So every subsequent debt is going to come at a higher cost because of the increased leverage and the cost of equity would also go up because of the degree of financial leverage. As a result of which the VAC is going to go up. Now this is not a, it's not a smooth curve. That, that's what you have to understand. There are slabs which different capital providers give you. So the bank will say that if you, if you got to borrow from 0 to 100 million, I'm going to charge you 4%. That means between this, the curve is going to be flat. The moment your borrowing goes up, the curve is going to, let's say, change. The rate is going to change. But what you have to understand is that the reason for change in the curve is not the total capital, but one of the sources. What I'm trying to say is the slabs given for cost of debt and slabs given for cost of equity, both put together will decide at how many levels has this break come in. So this break point is the amount of total capital at which the VAC curve, which was flat so far, suddenly changes its you know, tangent and then again becomes flat. So keep that in mind. So if let's say debt is, uh, so taking you know, this particular case, so it is at $100 that the debt cost is going to change and debt is about, let us say, you know, let, let's assume 40% of my total capital structure. So if debt is 40, uh, if debt is 100 and the percentage is 40, the break point is going to come at 250 because at when my total capital is going to be 250, it is at that point where my debt is going to be 40% of that which is 100 and it is at that point that my cost is going to go up from 4% to whatever, 5% or whatever else. So keep that in mind that your break points are the values of the total capital. But the reason for that change in the, or let's say the reason for those break points are the individual cost. Now, there is a concept called as pure play and pure play is, is an interesting concept wherein we are trying to say that if a new company ventures into some other industry, there has to be a lot of learnings that he has to get and whatever has been the, uh, you know, the erstwhile, the so far situation will not be helpful. So we are talking about the beta per se. So if there is a capital budgeting exercise that I have to do, so let's say an automotive company wants to get into pharma. So the beta of automotive will not be, uh, you know, helpful. The reason being that the pharma will have a different industry risk. So we try and look at a proxy and from his, let's say we try and look at another company uh, called as Pfizer. We will decode the industry out of it. So we will, <clears throat> beg your pardon. So we'll, we'll, you know, modify this particular beta so that I can use it for my particular project. So, so how do I do it? I would remove the financial risk from this beta of the proxy, make it an industry beta per se. This process is called as unlevering the beta, unlevering as in removing the effect of the leverage. And I'm going to borrow it and apply my own financial structure. That's called as levering the beta. Okay, so a simple formula that, that I can give you is overall beta or the unlevered beta is equal to the beta equity. Now you would yourself understand that your beta equity will be higher because it has the debt risk also. So it will be equal to equity plus debt 1 minus t. 
So keep this formula in mind. So if you have to arrive at beta overall, uh, you know, so, so this becomes the multiplier. If you have to arrive at beta equity, then the same multiplier will be the reciprocal of it. That's the only thing. So the, both the two equations are exactly the same. It's just that uh, the what you have to find out is changing. Okay. Then there was a concept of country risk premium in which we said that a that an investor, if investing into some other underdeveloped or relatively less developed country, would need some kind of an extra risk compensation to be, uh, let's say, excited to do that. So that risk compensation is difference between the the bonds of the both the government. So if, let's say a U.S. investor, the, the the treasury bills are trading at let's say three percent, and he is investing into Brazil where the rate is about 11%, that means 8% extra return that he's going to get while he invests into Brazil. And obviously, this is commensurate with the risk perception that the US investor would have uh, for Brazil. But keep that in mind that this is at a bond level, that too at a government bond level. You need to equitize that because ultimately, you have to calculate it from the point of view of equity. Return of equity is something that I'm you know, my investor is willing to calculate. So how do I equitize it? By placing a standard deviation of bond here and by placing a standard deviation of equity here. So an equity index ka standard deviation and a bond market's ka standard deviation is going to put here. So keep that in mind. So it's in simple form, we are equitizing this 8%. Uh, coming to a very, very small topic, which is called as leverage. Leverage is, is an easy bit. So you're maximizing your you know, input to get a much greater output. So, so, so leverage is actually the amplification that you get. So the entire income statement is divided into sales to EBIT to finally your EPS. So the first half is operating leverage in which you get a formula like that. So percentage change in EBIT divided by the percentage change in sales. Now, when we say units sold, we are assuming that your selling price is constant. So the better thing to do is to, you know, let's say take sales in dollar values here and calculate the percentage basis that uh, the second half of the formula is going to be the degree of financial leverage where a percentage change in net income or EPS is being referred to in context of the percentage change of the operating income. Now, what you have to understand also is that to calculate the percentage change, you need two years figure. So let's say 100 becomes 120 and the percentage change is 20%. If the question doesn't give you that, question gives you only one year's figure, then also you can calculate these the same values a little smartly. So you have, you know, your sales minus variable cost, giving you contribution, giving you operating fixed cost, uh, giving you EBIT. Okay, so we're talking about the operating leverage, which is happening because of this operating fixed cost. So the shortcut formula is anything above it is going to become the numerator here and the thing below it is going to become the denominator here. So that's broadly the idea by which you can create these shortcut formulas. Similarly here, you know, uh, the, the financial leverage happens because of the interest. So anything above interest is your EBIT, which is essentially here. And anything below interest is your PBT, which is essentially here. So that's how you can kind of calculate these shortcut formulas. And degree of total leverage again is no brainer your dol multiplied by dfl please do not add it's always multiplicative um, is going to give you the D dtl or dcl combined leverage or total leverage you know as the case may be the same point that i had measured uh, earlier that it's not break even point when we were referring it to under cost of capital Remember, we referred it to something called as a break point. Now, what we are referring right now is a break even point, which is a which is a number of units that I got to sell so that I can recover all my cost. Now, broadly, there are two fixed costs that I can, you know, worry about. The first is only operational. I don't worry about the financial cost or I worry about operational plus financial. So, so these are the two levels at which my break even point would also be calculated. Obviously, I need to sell much more number of units here because the additional fixed cost also needs to be, you know, calculated. If the additional fixed costs are not there, that means my total cost and only operating cost are same, then my break even point and operating break even point, these two are also going to be same. Okay, just a hypothetical point. 
coming to uh, you know working capital management one of the so to speak a b category uh, you know as far as importance is concerned not very critical there are a lot of ratios which are already done in your uh, you know fra so there are current ratio quick ratio now these are all that you've done in your ratio analysis these are all related to working capital the operational assets and liabilities so what do you include in your operation current assets your cash your bank your marketable securities your account receivables your inventories and your prepaid expense and your current liabilities typically are the outstanding salaries your purchase <clears throat> the payment that you have to do etc etc so quick ratio is trying to find out the repayment capacity but in a little shorter span of time so while current ratio will have all the current assets to take care of the liabilities the quick ratio will have only let's say top three so cash short-term marketable security and receivable it will not have inventory and it will also not have the prepaid expense okay then these are the turnover ratios I'm not going to get into each one of this is exactly the same that you have done in your uh, FRA so the number of days of inventory the payable turnovers so, so and so forth okay now operating cycle is something that is critical from an exam standpoint which is equal to the inventory holding period plus the debtor holding period so when we deduct the the number of days payable from it that means you're netting it off therefore you get a net operating cycle which is also called as the working capital cycle and the cash conversion cycle all the three names are given to the similar uh, you know the number of days that we are talking about now comes the little confusing part in uh, the working capital management so this is related to the 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 uh, you know towards the fact end of your particular reading where we're talking about the short-term borrowings and investing so these are different places uh, you know different formulas different uh, structures according to which you will have to just you know park your funds or let's say borrow your funds in a particular context so when we're talking about money market now money market yield is typically on the basis of 360 days globally so so let me just put a you know to put a bit of context here so there are different uh, you know number of days in month and divided by days in year so there are, there are broadly there are three notations which is prevalent in the fixed income securities so one is 30 upon 360 the other one is actual upon actual and then it is actual upon 360 now these are the you know for convenience it has been decided so any government bond is going to follow this any corporate bond typically follows this notation and the money market follows this particular notation so do you see here that the number of days is going to be actual but uh, 360 is going to be used not 365 however in context of a corporate bond uh, you know or let's say the government bond so so it, it will you know so every unit will have a different notation my only request is you got to be a little more uh, you know kind of sharp in your memory to be able to recall on the basis of you know that particular day so if let's say we're talking about a treasury bill then a treasury bill is typically uh, you know on the basis of discounts that you get so you have hundred dollars today being issued for 98 so 2 upon 98 you know will give you the yield so all that calculation you know and you have done in your fixed income so it's just like the you know the same point being repeated here so the discount percentage which you have been referring to is, is so and so forth so so I don't need to tell you exactly you know uh, you know what what exactly needs to be done as far as these are concerned then uh, again uh, the different sources of uh, borrowing from let's say short-term funding from bank and all of that so you have different line of credit cost the cost of that so you to your charge interest and your commitment fees and uh, you have to divide it by the loan amount now what you have to remember in these formulas is what is a denominator and what is a numerator sometimes the denominator is going to be the full loan amount sometimes it's going to be uh, you know the interest will be deducted at source and let's say you borrowed hundred and uh, for one year for which the interest is turning out to be eight dollars the lender is going to give you 92 itself so the net proceeds is 92 so let's say the bankers acceptance cost what you finally get is you know the net proceeds in in hand so the cost that you will have to calculate is like this however in case of line of credit cost the final loan amount is 100 the interest is going to you know be 8 and let's say commitment fee is 1 so so you you now be able to appreciate the difference in the denominator much well 
okay so we have nothing called as loan amount minus the interest so exactly you know this is the same thing that we are talking about here so this again becomes your net proceed so this is, this appears to be a little confusing but do it to do them a little patiently so i think it's been a good quick rapid fire round of all the formulas would give you some sense of you know how things have uh, been you know taken into account uh, the other other readings that you see uh, you know are very theoretical in nature and they're, they're a little more conceptual so so there are not many formulas in which so we thought of kind of skipping it for the moment so so all the best and uh, you know do very well in the exam thank you